Jake with everyone, Kojima Toshi, and welcome back to episode number 64, I think, of the Inline G for Luch podcast with me, your host, motherfucking Inline G. It is lovely to be back with you all, just us, no pesky guests getting in the way of me calling random people on the internet a dickhead. This is Inline G unfiltered. By the way, do you guys prefer the solo episodes or the guest episodes? I mean, I love both. It is a bit of a shame that they're so different. I mean, in an ideal world, I would have two separate flute podcasts, but to be honest, guys, I haven't got the fucking time to be running around doing bloody flute podcasts. I've got other things to be doing. But it's nice to be back, just us, and we're in a beautiful surrounding today because I'm back home in the beautiful north of Ireland, and I'm at my dad's house sitting out in the back garden recording a podcast because, as fucking usual, I have left this to the very last minute. This podcast is coming out in about 12 hours' time, so fuck but we've got it. I wrote a beautiful episode. It's been something I've been thinking about for a while. And I genuinely saved this one for Ireland. I thought, oh, I'll record this in Ireland. Maybe not the recording aspect, but certainly the inspiration aspect. And my general thoughts around the subject would have been heightened and more clear, I think, after a few days in Ireland. So that's been the case. Now, talking about solo episodes in this podcast, first of all, I've really enjoyed writing another solo episode. It's been like four weeks since I've written one since NFA. I haven't really been writing any, and it is a shame because I fucking love writing solo episodes. I love the research. I love going down these rabbit holes on the internet that take me in all kinds of weird directions. I love the total freedom to explore whatever's going on in my mind and to write something about it. It's total, total unfiltered creativity. And I approach it with a very playful mindset. And I have a fuckload of fun with it. I have a blast. Like, if you ever take, like, a, a small child or a wee kid to the forest and you just watch them, you know, they're grabbing sticks, they're climbing up shit, they're putting their hands in the water. Why? Just because they want to see what it's like. That's what I feel like with this podcast when I'm writing solo episodes. I just go and do shit. I touch shit. I find out what's going on. And I have a blast doing it. I just do it because I want to do it. And I wish I could take that creativity and playfulness and that emotional state to my practice, to my flute practice, especially when I'm approaching a new piece of music and I'm wondering how am I going to interpret this or how am I going to play it. I wish I could do all that without the pressure of the technical limitations that are put on the instrument. You know, when I get a new piece of music, I'm thinking, fuck, have I played the right notes? Have I done this? Have I done that? And I'm not really approaching it in an artistic mindset. And I think I would enjoy it a lot more if I did. And this is a subject that I think about constantly. I've talked about it in this podcast many fucking times. Uh, is interpretation an art? Are we artists or are we technicians? So, for example, when you play a piece of music by Mozart, are we the artist or is Mozart the artist? And we're just purely technicians getting there. Or does our interpretation have mixed aspects of playing the instrument, writing, playing the notes, and also being an artist? And if so, how much? Is it 50% artistry, 50% technician? Is it half-half? Are we 80%? We just have to get the notes right and do the shit, and 20% is up to us. Where's the balancer? I really don't know. And for the record, by the way, when I say technicians or technicality on an instrument, I mean mechanics, the actual mechanics of playing an instrument. So, you know, playing the right notes, playing the correct rhythms, playing them in the right time, observing any tempo markings or speeds that the, the composers put in, any dynamics that the composers put in. Also things like intonation, articulation, quality of tone, all these like basic things, which generally seem like binary attributes. You know, you're right or you're wrong. But they actually have their own grey areas within them. And choosing where we are in the grey area, I often ask myself, is that artistry? Deciding where we sit in the grey area. Now, the way I look at it is there's a bar, right? So there's a little bar we have to get over first, and then we're into that grey area. So there's a certain level we just have to get up, and then we're like, right, now we're away. A great analogy for this actually is boxing. I'm boxing mad, and I'm thinking a lot about boxing, the sport, because tomorrow night, so today's Friday, this podcast comes out, tomorrow night is Saturday, a Belfast fighter, Anto Kakachi, is fighting on the Anthony Joshua undercard at Wembley Stadium to defend his world title. We have another world champion from Belfast, so I fucking love boxing. I'm thinking a lot about boxing at the minute. So for that, this analogy just felt bang on. I'm so hyped for that as well. If anyone wants to send me a message tomorrow to wish Anto a good luck, I'll pass it on to him. But anyway, in boxing, so you take boxing. To fight professionally, you can't just walk into a boxing ring and away you go. You can't have a professional boxer come up to you and say, listen, I'll pay you 20 grand just to get in the ring with me. I'll knock your shite in. And you sign a waiver. That's not how it works. You can't just do that. Um, aside from all the medical tests and licensing laws around having a manager, having a promoter, all that kind of shit, you actually have to demonstrate quite a amount 
of skills, like basic boxing skills to whatever boxing control board you're talking about. So if I decide tomorrow I'm going to go fight professionally in the boxing ring and someone approaches me to do so, I don't have a license to box. So I would go to the British Boxing Board of Control and I would say, listen lads, I want to fight, I need a license. They'll do medical tests, obviously, a very intensive set of medical tests to make sure I'm fit to fight and I don't get killed when I'm in the boxing ring. Then they will check to make sure I have things like a manager, a promoter. Do I have all the right legal things in place? Do I have a bank account? Am I in control of my own finances whenever the money comes in, etc., etc.? Do I have a trainer? You have to make sure you have a trainer as well. But after you do all that shit, there is a certain amount of tests that are done. So what will happen is, when you pass all that shit, one of the people from the boxing control board will go with you to your gym and say, right, you're going to have to, you're going to have to show, show me some shit here. You have to demonstrate sort of a, a basic understanding of the standard punches. So you'll go into a boxing ring with the examiner and he'll say things right, show me a jab, show me a hook, show me an uppercut, show me a straight cross, et cetera, et cetera. You also have to add a bit of an understanding of the different stances. So you have to be able to show that you understand what orthodox stance is, southpaw stance, et cetera, et cetera. You have to know what your rules are with holding on to your opponent, when you can go to the referee, about counting, all that kind of stuff. Now, this feels like it's to make sure that professional boxing doesn't become some kind of outlet to let angry people go and batter each other without any police intervention. And that is, that is kind of true, to be really honest, because a lot of people want to do that. But its main reason is safety. So boxing is a brutal sport, and if you fuck it up, you could be dead. So demonstrating all these skills and understanding is important to prove that you can defend yourself in a boxing ring. It's also why you're crucially tested on your ability to defend all of these aspects. You have to show that you can safely defend yourself in a ring. So this test is purely technical. You can you can prove to everybody that you have the basic technical skills necessary to look after yourself in a ring. That's it. That's the main line. Once you get your license, then you can go box. Away you go. Fill your boots. Box whatever you want. Now the danger and the threats of boxing are still there. But avoiding them then is up to your own personal skill, your training, the temperament of the fighter. But that basic test has been passed and you're allowed to go. Now, I won't get into how sport for me is an art form because I do believe sport is an art form. But to bring this all back to flute playing, all these aspects of technicality have to be passed before you can get into the ring of interpretation. Isn't that a beautiful analogy, lads? Fuck me. I'm so proud of that, boys. So proud of that. So the test to get your license to interpret. There we are. License to interpret. That's a good name for the episode, isn't it? The license to interpret, fuck. But anyway, the test to go and interpret freely, in my opinion, is binary. So, when you're playing a piece of music, you have to get your test first, and the test will be things like, you have to play the right notes. If it's F sharp, you have to play a fucking F sharp, okay? If it's a group of triplets, you have to play an even group of triplets. Uh, The notes have to be in tune. Basically in tune. Within that little range of tuning, they have to be in tune. If the composer wrote forte and piano, you have to show that there's a difference between those two things. Um, if they're written to tongue some notes and slur some notes, you have to make sure some of them are tongued and some of them are slurred. And you have to have, even on tone, you have to have a generally consistent tone throughout. You can't be dropping notes or splitting shit. That's the basic binary right and wrong tests. Now, once you've passed all those things, you've got your license. You've got your license to interpret. Then you can go and get into the subtleties of the grey areas because there are subtleties. There are grey areas within all those aspects. They're not binary, but you have to pass the test first. Get your license to box. Now you can come into the ring. So, talking about the grey areas, rhythms, let's start there. Rhythms have room for interpretation, okay? Yes, there's right and wrong. Triplets have to be played three even groups within one beat. That's true. But, like, take a perfect example. Have you ever heard Jimmy Galway play, like, a long scale in Mozart? Like a group of semi quivers which are meant to be dum dugga 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 deem, and he'll do dum da 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 deem, and he'll pick the notes up, so he'll slow down the first two and delay the rhythm, and then catch what he's missed in terms of timing at the end of the scale. That's not in time. Like, that's not bang on the rhythm, but that is an interpretive choice. That's totally fine. You can do that. Okay, that's a slightly more extreme example of it, but... We all do this. When you get towards a cadential point or towards the end of the piece, you slow down a little bit. Even if it's not written into the piece, you slow down because that's just fucking normal to do. That's an example of that. There's a grey area within interpretation. Grey area within uh, rhythm. Intonation. There is a grey area within intonation. There is not right and wrong. Fucking tuners are not in tune. I will die on this hill. I did an episode on this. Tuners are not in tune. Okay? Tuners are basic. Yes, you have to be able to play in tune to a tuner. If you're playing with a piano to an extent, but there's still gray areas within them if you make a note slightly sharper or slightly flatter you will color it differently 
I'm not talking to the point where it becomes a semitone or even a quarter of a tone, but still changing it will change the color and that is artistry. That is your choice to do. If you don't agree with what I'm saying, go fuck yourself. Go watch the episode, okay? Go watch the fucking episode I talked about intonation because it took me a long time to research that episode and it's fucking right. Anyway, so articulation next. Yes, okay, so the composer might say you have the tongue this and start this, but what kind of tongue? Because the, the composer doesn't go into that level of depth. You know, obviously the tongue in your mouth, you're using... <laughs> but, like, seriously, do you use a soft D sound? Do you use a more pointed T sound? Like... There's so many options within. That's a spectrum within itself, going from D to T. Sit with your mouth now and play with it. Go da 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 Switch between D and T. There's a whole fucking world in there of what you can play with. Which one do you use? That's your choice. Tone. Fuck me, I could go on for days about tone. But tone, there is obviously a grey area. There is a binary. Okay, you have to play with a nice tone. There is a basic line of a nice tone. What that means is there's no splitting, first of all. The sound is focused. There's no drop in the sound general basic tone after that the words are fucking oyster you know what are you going to do you're going to make this one a little bit darker a little bit lighter essentially you're going to add a more richness to your sound by putting in those lower harmonics and searching for a sound that's richer or you're going to make it a little bit lighter are you you can even the air the airiness around the sound that fluffy sound that can be used really well to beautiful effect if we want to and again within that there's an entire spectrum so there's so many different fucking things you can do and all these things are interpretation you get to play with these things after you get your boxing license, okay? Or your license to interpret. Fuck me, I'm losing my own analogy. And in my opinion, any form of interpretation is inherently an art, okay? And we should talk about art because art isn't some fucking highfalutin fucking abstract idea, despite the fact that Americans love to throw the word about in that sense. Art is simple, okay? Art is, art is really just expressing yourself or expressing something through a medium, so you can express anything. You can express an emotion, an idea, a concept, a scene, a colour, a smell, the taste of Denny strawberry cheesecake French toast. And you do it via something. So it could be poetry, it could be fiction, podcasting, for example. It could be acting, painting, drawing, singing, dancing, playing a fucking instrument, etc., etc. Ad infinitum is endless. So interpretation of technical aspects, in my opinion, is itself an art. But what's been getting me for so long on this subject is... Do I call myself an artist when I'm interpreting music written by someone else? Am I the artist? I always feel like, I feel like Mozart is the artist. For example, if I'm playing Mozart, and it's my role to get Mozart's music from him to the audience. I'm an intermediary. And although I know these, there's an artistic expression involved in doing this, I'm aware of that, I wonder if there's enough of an artistic expression to justify the title of artist. I know that sounds like dog shit. I'm kind of contradicting myself in five minutes ago, but still. So, this is what I've been thinking about for a long time. You've heard me talk about this on the podcast multiple times, but something happened last week, lads. I was listening to a podcast, all right? And here, lads, I, I listen to podcasts too. I don't just fucking make them. I listen to them. Oh, fuck me. By the way, that is one day old Diet Coke from the cinema. I went to the cinema last night to see the kneecap movie. Fuck me. That is a great movie. If you ever want to see what Belfast and the north of Ireland is actually like, and a fair representation, go see that. It's about those two, that rap group, kneecap, kneecap who I love. Um, it's like a dramatised, semi-autobiographical film about their life. Michael Fassbender's in it. It's fucking incredible. It is so good. I had to see it when I came home because it's not out in Germany to fucking January. But it's out in North America. So, you fucking Yanks and you Canadians, you can go over and see it now. Go see it. Tell me what you think. It is hilarious and it's fucking brilliant. It's going to be one of my favourite movies now. But anyway, back to the podcast. Now, podcasting. One of my absolute favourite podcasts in the world, on God's green earth, is the Blind Boy Podcast. Now, I don't have many Irish listeners on this podcast, unfortunately. But the few of you out there will know who Blind Boy Boat Club is. You might know him for being in the Rubber Bandits who had the song Horse Outside, back in the early noughties. But you might know Blind Boy for his other things. Now, Blind Boy Boat Club is a pseudonym that he uses when he does podcasts and when he writes fiction or short stories or when he makes music. And he's wonderful. He's a great artist. One of my favourite people. I've been listening to his podcast for years, every single week. Um, and if you ever go and listen to the Blind Boy podcast, you will notice similarities with that podcast and this one very, very fucking quickly. That one has had its fair influence on me, I'm not going to lie. 
No, I didn't steal anything. So don't fucking come for me. Yeah, but what's that phrase? Good artists borrow, great artists steal. So go fuck yourself. I don't know who said that, but whoever said that phrase was definitely a fucking thief. But anyway, Blind Boy had this live podcast in Bristol. And his guest was a woman called Claire Murphy. Now, Claire is an Irish woman, and her professional job, her life, her career, is a storyteller. Now, I didn't know that that could be a profession in 2024. You can be a storyteller as a job. And hearing Claire speak was fucking incredible. So I went to her website, because I tried to figure out a way of how I could sum this up to you guys. So from her website, this is what it says. Uh, Storytelling. Since 2006, Clara brings the ancient art of story firmly into the contemporary world where it belongs. Her story repertoire includes Irish mythology, wisdom tales, history, world folklore, and quantum physics. Clara has told stories to President Mary Robinson, the All Blacks coaches, mission critical teams, school children, performing on stages and in festivals around the world. Clara also teaches storytelling skills to communities worldwide, including asylum seekers, social entrepreneurs, climate change scientists, fighters, and limbless veterans. So, in this podcast, the Blind Boy podcast, uh, Claire talks about her career as a storyteller, what it means to be one, and why the role is so important, and what's involved in it. What what is a storyteller? Now, Ireland. We'll get into this because Claire is Irish. Ireland has a long history of storytellers and storytelling. It's properly ingrained in Irish culture. Now, before I go on. Because I know I've got you on the hook there. Before I go on to how all this translates into interpretive music, I'm going to do my uh, my Patreon read. I need to get this out of the way, lads. So, if you've actually went and listened to an episode of the Blind Boy podcast, you'll notice that what I'm about to do in my Patreon read in general, what I always do, is borrowed. Heavily. Heavily borrowed. There's a great word. No, sir, don't arrest me. I was only heavily borrowing it. Go fuck yourself, officer. Okay. So, guys. Uh... The Inline G podcast is free and always will be free. However, if you want to donate to the podcast, you can now do so through the Patreon. On the screen now is the address. And for the audio listeners, it is patreon.com forward slash the Inline G flute podcast. It costs five euros a month, whatever that is, in your dollars or pounds. And with that, you are genuinely keeping this podcast alive. Listen, you get four episodes a month of this podcast. Come rain, nor fucking shine. And if you saw me in a pub and you thought, fuck, I love what Gareth does, I listen to all the episodes, I'm going to buy him a pipe to say thank you, you can do that online now, okay? I do everything around here on my own in this podcast, including marketing, graphic design, research, scripts, audio production, video production, you name it, I fucking do it. Becoming a patron helps generate a regular income for this podcast, meaning I can turn down other work to focus on it. It also means I'm getting paid as an artist, which in 2024 is not an easy fucking thing to do. So, uh, you'll maybe get the odd little benefit, I've thrown about some trading cards for free. You get your episodes a little bit earlier. But generally, you're doing it to support the podcast. And it is hugely appreciated. If you can afford to do it, it's just a fiver a month. It is genuinely so appreciated. Fuck me, I cannot tell you guys how happy I am that people are giving their hard-earned money to me, to me, this podcast. So thank you very much if you are a patron. If you can afford to, it is incredibly appreciated. But listen, if you can't afford to do it, it's a hard time. Times are tough, especially for artists. There's a cost-of-living crisis. Don't worry. Don't worry about it. You can keep listening for free. Someone else is paying so you can listen for free. It's a lovely, lovely system. And also, if you do sign up, you can jump out at any time. Okay? In and out you go. I do it all the time. So, Patreon, thank you very much. Now, back to storytelling. I've said from the start of this podcast, from episode one, from day one, I wanted this podcast to feel like you're in a pub with me. 1 a.m. in the morning. And there's... That's a that's a legitimate cultural phenomenon in Ireland, shite talking at a pub at 1 a.m. That's a thing that happens. When we go to the pub... We don't listen to music often in Ireland in the pub and we don't play games, Jesus Christ. We, we just sit around a table and you have drink and you tell stories. That's what we do. That's what we always do. That's what I love more than anything in the fucking world. And you're telling stories maybe from the day you've had. You're telling stories from the past. You're telling other people's stories that you've heard. It's all we really do. Irish people culturally structure so many of our daily interactions with each other like a story. So we'll always, no matter what interaction you're having with an Irish person, it will generally have... A start, a middle, and an end. We understand that structure, and it's how we prefer to communicate. It's also historically why Ireland has punched well above its weight in the literary field. We've had so many great writers over the years from such a tiny fucking place. So, Claire, back to Claire Murphy. She's talking about storytelling. And as she was doing, I had one of those light bulb moments. And I was like, fuck. 
That's it. You know those eyeball moments people bang on about? I didn't get the wee ding, but I wish I did. But I was out in my, I was out in my daily walk, my wee walk around Cologne, and I had to actually stop. Stop dead in my tracks, take out my phone and make a note. I actually just wrote down the note, Interpreted, interpreting is storytelling, do an episode. Full stop. That was it. Uh, one day I'm going to go through my iPhone notes with you guys. If there's anything related to this inline G podcast, you see the absolute shit I have written in there. But anyway, when Claire talked about this, it took all those conflicting ideas I had and feelings I had about interpretation, and it just brought this immediate sense of clarity. We are storytellers, and that's it. That's all it is. That's what we are as musicians. We are storytellers, but as Irish people. We are storytellers as well. So I'm going to do a bit of a history on that because this is one of the rabbit holes I went down. I think you'll enjoy this too. So anyway, why are Irish people storytellers? Well, we go back hundreds of years, thousands of years, right? To before Irish people even spoke English. So English actually only came into Ireland in the 12th century. And it only became the lingua franca sort of towards the 1800s. Before that, we had Irish. Um, this is why when people ask us, why do we hate the Brits so fucking much? This is why. This is why we hate the Brits so fucking much. Because they tried their absolute best to destroy the Irish language. And they got very fucking close. Although, there is a huge revival these days. Especially in the kneecap movie. Go fucking see it. You. Um, Irish, as a language, has always been an oral language. It was rarely written down. If ever. Also, on that. It's called Irish. It's not called Gaelic, okay? Gaelic is a term for the group of languages. It's called Irish, and especially, Jesus Christ, it's not called Gaelic, like the Americans love to say. A Gaelic is what a man and another man do to each other when they love each other very, very much. <laughs> oh, fuck. Also, on a side note, I'm feeling so anti-American at the minute. Oh, Christ. Lads, he's did all right with me for a while. I came back from NFN. I was like, fuck, they have Denny's. They have Raising Kids. Maybe they're not that bad, to be honest, over there. You fucking are. This election... You can go fuck yourselves. I am sick to the back teeth of watching fucking Americans on TikTok doing the election stuff. Oh, these are all fucking idiots. You know the way you say, like, oh, not all Americans are idiots? Honestly, the 97% of these are fucking idiots. I'm sorry. These are the 3% that aren't listening to this podcast. But do you know what I don't get? You have two candidates running for this electoral race. This has been a thing. It's been a running theme through Europe in the last few years where you've had two pretty starkly different candidates. So, for example, in France, for the last elections, you've had Macron and Le Pen. So Marine Le Pen is hard right. Macron's a fucking wanker as well. But when you go to any, like, if you watch any show talking about what normal French people are voting, the reason Macron gets in is they openly say, listen, it's I don't like Macron either. I'm voting against Le Pen. That's it. It's a protest vote. When Labour won the UK elections recently, it's not the Labour Party we all know and love. It's a very centrist Blairite fucking Labour. Labour under Keir Starmer is not Labour. And... We have the same thing. We're like, right, well, I don't really want to vote for Labour, but it's an anti-Tory vote. It's a protest vote against the Conservative Party. Not happy with it, but I'm going to fucking do it. You guys don't do that. Americans don't fucking do that. They go like, oh, we love Harris. We love Kamala. And you're like, fuck off, right? Kamala Harris is a terrible fucking candidate again. Honestly, the Democrat Party over there is making such a bollocks of it. Terrible fucking candidate. But if I was in America, obviously I'd vote for her because I'm not going to vote for fucking Donald Trump as much as I love him. I wouldn't vote for Donald Trump, but fucking hell, what is it about you guys just taking the team like it's a fucking sports match and going, oh, no, we all love Harrison, she's perfect, she's a fucking, I watched that debate the other night, which is talking about, it's like, Israel has the right to defend itself, and we will support, and you go, fuck yourself, you're the same as them all, and you put me right off America, so the amount of people like, oh, we love Kamala, and wearing the badges and all that shit, and you're like, go fuck yourselves, just say you don't want Trump to win, you're going to vote for Harris, you don't really want to, because it's not really a left-leaning party, but fuck it, we'll do it, anyway. Get that off. Got that out of my chest. Thank you. Got it off my chest. Anyway, let's go back. So back to Ireland. Back to ancient Ireland. So from the 12th to the 7th centuries in Ireland, you had 17 high kings. So the high kings of Ireland belonged to different regions in Ireland. It was divided up into 17 different regions. Now, the second highest title in all of Ireland after the high king was that of the Shanachie. Now, Shanachie, it's an old Irish word and it means bearer of lore. And the Shanachie's role was to pass laws, decrees, keep history, keep stories, and then do all that and pass it on orally to other people. So, you would think of your Shanachie as your local historian, it'd be your library, it'd be your genealogist. It's all rolled in to one person. We didn't write anything down. Irish was purely oral. So if you wanted any information in your village about anything, you went to the Shanachie. He would tell you. And he kept it all up in his head, and he told the stories, and he told the lore, 
And if you want to know who your great granny was, he'll know it as well. That's what Sean and Keys did. They held all the world's information and their sole job was to share this information as ac accurately as possible. And then they'd also be responsible for training a new Sean and Key, who the new one would then hold all the information that they've been passed on from the previous one and be taught how to gather new information. Um, but one of the Shawnakee's great roles was to pass on stories of folklore and mythology. Things like the, to the tales of Finn McCool or Cucullin, these great Irish mythological characters. Now, unfortunately, many Shawnakee were eradicated during the English invasions, the many fucking English invasions, and the subsequent destruction of Irish culture. But some still exist today. There's still the odd Shawnakee knocking about. One famous example is a guy called Eddie, Eddie Lenehan. Now, Eddie's still alive. Eddie's only like, what, 74? Something around that, 74, 75 now. Irish people will be familiar with Eddie, especially because he did like the orbit of TV and a bit of storytelling on the radio and all that kind of stuff. He's a practicing Shawnakee. He keeps the tradition alive today. But he's probably most well known for his per uh, preservation campaign he did in 1999 out in County Clare. So in 1999, the Irish government had approved the construction of this brand new motorway or a highway for my less educated listeners. And part of this motorway passed through the town of Latoon. Now, Latoon is down in County Clare. It's a wee tiny area. It's not even really a village, to be honest. Now, as the plans were unveiled of where the motorway is going to go, it came to everyone's attention that it would pass through a hawthorn bush, just common hawthorn, nothing special, common hawthorn bush, and they'd have to cut down the bush to make way for the motorway. Now, however, locals knew that this particular bush was known to be a fairy bush. It's where the fairies lived. And it was actually noted that this particular bush was a meeting place for Munster fairies, the region of Ireland, when they were preparing to go to war with the Connaught fairies. So it's one of the four provinces of Ireland. You have Munster, Connaught, Ulster and Leinster. So that's where they would meet before they would go to battle. Now I should say here, by the way, when we're talking about the fairies, for my non-Irish listeners, we're not talking about fucking Tinkerbell. Okay? Irish fairies are a very different beast. They're dangerous, capricious entities that you should not fuck with. That is a basic rule. For example, up until worryingly recent, like we're talking about the 1980s, out in Connemara in the west of Ireland, one of the strongest beliefs of the fairies is if you have a child that is born with some kind of physical deformity or Down syndrome or things like that, the belief was that the fairies were punishing you for something you did. So what they did was they snuck in at night, stole your baby, made a copy of it, and gave you a poor copy back. And that's why your baby had physical deformities or Down syndrome. They're bad bastards fairies. You want to stay away from them. Um, so anyway, this particular type of bush was known as a ring fort. Now, when Eddie Lenehan heard that they were chopping it down for the motorway, he started this huge campaign to stop the Irish government. And he actually he wrote a letter to the Irish Times, an open letter that was picked up then by the New York Times in 1999. And it said, actually, I've got a line from it here. It says, if you move or destroy a fairy fort or a Celtic ring fort, you'll be in trouble and you're creating trouble. Never shift a fairy bush. It belongs where it is and nowhere else. And it worked. So the Latoon Ferry bus stayed. Eddie was successful and it stands there to this day, that bush. And there's loads of stories like that. There's hundreds of them in Ireland. There's actually one in fucking Anna Cloy. Anna Cloy is about, it's about two miles that way. Just down there. You can walk it from here. Anna Cloy, in 1964, there was a huge building project planned. And it was abandoned because the builders found out that it was a Celtic or a fairy ring fort or a Celtic ring fort. And they abandoned it because the builders were like, fuck that, we're not building it, we'll be dead within a week. And they just refused to work, they went on strike. Just down the road here. That happens all the time. You know, even University College Dublin, one of our great universities in Ireland, made a statement about all this saying, uh, where is it? While the people of modern Ireland scoff publicly at fairy stories, ashamed to admit their beliefs and superstitions to strangers, there is still strong vestigial belief in the fairies. I I don't know if I believe in them, but you know, better fucking safe than sorry, to be honest. So we have a lot of these tales, and you won't find many of them on the internet. Don't go Googling that now, because they're all local. They're very small local stories. Even in this wee village here, where I am now, called Anna Hilt, there's all kinds of fairy stories and ghost stories and banshee stories that you'll only hear at a pub from a local. And that is essentially the role of a Shawnakee. So back to Claire Murphy. She said some things in this interview which really, really got me thinking. Firstly, she said, the role of live storytelling is vital. And it's kind of comparable to reading a Shakespeare play and seeing one live. She didn't say Shakespeare, but I'm throwing that in for you. Reading the play or seeing it live. The words are the same in both. But 
you have a collective experience, first of all, together of seeing this live. And that's a totally different aspect to it all. And it gives a totally different emotional response to the entire piece of art. But also the actor's timing, their tone, their turn of phrase, their movements on stage, they, these are what make the words truly come alive. And it makes them resonate with us on a much deeper and more profound level. And then she says something, which again, I had to stop, lads. I had to stop and take out my phone to make a note of. She said, the role of a storyteller is to make sense of a story in the now. Bingo. That's it. That, that was like, fuck. That is brilliant. She's a fucking genius. Because like, when you tell a story, right, there's... How you're going to tell it depends on a lot of different factors. Some of them are very personal. How are you feeling that day? Um, what, what kind of general period is going on in your life at that time? Are you going through difficult things? For example, a complicated and nuanced story with a few emotional twists and turns may suddenly find the more humorous parts getting special attention and weight on an especially good day for you. Likewise, if you're going through something difficult in your life, it's natural to notice the parallels between your emotional state and any corresponding emotions in the story. So if you're going through a bereavement and the story features a death that maybe previously you just sort of rolled over is the wrong word, but you maybe breezed past and didn't pay too much attention to, um, yeah, you didn't pay too much attention to it to put too much weight on, suddenly that death become much more poignant and it means you're going to express it in a totally different way than usual. Now, that's, that same emotional fact, by the way, can be seen so fucking clearly in music. So clearly. We've all had this experience of going through a breakup and listening to a little bit more Death Cab for Cutie than we should be, okay? Or your favourite football team, winning the league and having September by Earth, Wind & Fire, played on loop for an hour and a half. <coughs> Me in May. Music has the power to heighten, soothe, contradict, and complement any emotion we have just by listening to it. Just by listening to it. Now, as music makers... It makes total sense the same thing can happen to us and how we, when we approach our interpretations, especially in instrumental music. So in instrumental music, we don't have the words, which is so important because the words will tell us exactly what's going on and which emotion they're trying to create. Generally, yeah, you have to read into them, but they certainly help. Without words or without lyrics, it makes the expression much more difficult or much more personal. There's a much more wide spectrum of what could be meant. And... When we're trying to convey these different ideas, there's a couple of different ways we can do it. So we can approach it from a conscious perspective, perhaps where a certain bar or a certain section of a piece of music by back, we, if we're on a day where we're not feeling great, where emotions aren't great, we're a bit sad, we're a bit upset, something went wrong, we're feeling a bit gloom, we can interpret that bar or that section as sadness and we'll express it accordingly. Or... Sometimes those expressions are unconscious. I think, honestly, more often than not, they're unconscious. Where we suddenly find maybe our articulations are a little bit more dull, our tempo are a little bit slower, tempy, sorry, or tempy or slower, our tone's a bit darker than usual, and we're generally leaning away from flashiness or virtuosity. And it's only when we look back on that a few days later, we're like, ah, oh, fuck, right enough, I was in a terrible place, and that's probably linked to why I was doing these things although I didn't know it at the time. And then this is the same in storytelling. How you tell a story is hugely dependent on who and in what circumstances we're telling the story. So if you're telling the story of, I don't know, how you went to an American flute convention and you were in a pub with your mates, the part where you went to a Denny's at 4am with your head spinning like the exorcist becomes an integral part because you're telling to your mates in the pub and you want some laughs. But if I'm telling the same story, or sorry, if someone, if one is telling the same story to a future employer, for example, or your parents, or in an interview, you might skirt over the Denny's incident and you might go a little bit more to the respective flute players you could come on your podcast, whoever would do such a thing. In both cases, the story is the same, but it's bent and molded into a shape that best suits the audience. And that is a vital aspect of creating music, especially when interpreting the music of others. If you, as I do, view our roles as intermediaries between the composer and the audience, analysing and explaining, not explaining, analysing exactly, sorry, analysing exactly who your audience is on any given performance, it's paramount to building that relationship. You've only got two people in the relationship outside of yourself. One of them is fluid and it will change a lot. So you have to analyse that constantly, decide, right, well, if I'm going to build that relationship, who am I actually playing to? Who is the audience in this case? For example, are the audience in a lovely, big, comfortable concert hall with a few glasses of something sparkling in their hands and the feet relaxed and the feet excited. And then you've got a lovely, 
blank canvas to paint on when it comes to positive emotions or enjoyous emotions. But if you're going to go towards the more dark, dark, shocking, violent emotions, that can have a more startling effect than usual. They're not ready for it. But if your audience is a bunch of lads in the pub on a Saturday night, they're much more open to these extremities and the darkness and the violence because they've had a few pints around the pub. It's a normal circumstance for these things to happen. Now, these are two really ridiculous examples, okay? But you see my point. There's a whole range of ways that you can be expressing to audiences and there's a whole range of audiences that you could be expressing to at any given time. And your job is to tell the story in the now. Now, lads, I... We're getting towards the end of this podcast. I don't know if there's a moral in all this story. I don't know if it'll serve you the way it did me. I've been thinking a lot about it. I got an enormous sense of relief and purpose from hearing about a Shauna Key. And feeling like one myself. A musical Shauna Key, if you will. So, before we go, I'm going to leave you with this wee story. This wee bit of information. Oh, I've been talking too much, lads. This wee bit of information. Uh... Let me to brighten your day. So Celtic mythology or Irish mythology has lots of gods for many different things. But unlike Greek or Norse mythology, we actually don't have a god of music. Now the reason behind that is believed to be that because music is so central to Irish history and features so often in our folklore, that it can't be the domain of just one god. Now to show how ingrained music is in Irish culture, uh, do you know... That is the only country in the world. Ireland is the only country in the world where we have a musical instrument as our emblem. We have the harp. It is the instrument of Ireland. And in fact, fun fact, on the pint of Guinness, on any pint of Guinness, there's the Guinness logo as a harp. It's the harp facing to the right. Guinness have trademarked that. So if you want the harp facing to the right, it's only on Guinness. The Irish government themselves have to use it on our passports to the left because Guinness have already trademarked it. But anyway... Our official emblem, our national emblem, is the harp. It's on our government buildings, it's on our passports, it's on any document you ever get from the state. It's always there. Only country in the world to have that. Now, one famous story in Irish mythology is the story of Lu, the sun god. He was a fierce warrior with a spear. this like magic spear, I think it was. But he was also the god of arts and crafts. And he himself was a harp player. Apparently a very, very accomplished virtuoso harp player. Now, in the story of Lu, when he comes to Tara... Now, Tara, by the way, is a very important place in Irish mythology. It's where the High King of Ireland had his throne. So we talk a lot about Tara. Tara still exists today. There's still Tara is a part of Ireland. Now, when Lou goes to Tara, he's seeking an audience with the High King as Ireland is preparing to fight off an invasion from the Fomori. Now, the Fomori are a supernatural race of these evil monster demon things, basically. Um, they're believed to have mystical powers. Uh, pack of wankers, basically. So they're invading Ireland, and... The High King is trying to figure out a way to defend Ireland against the oncoming invasion. So Lou goes and talks to him. Now, as he goes to seek an audience with Nuda, who is the High King, he must convince the gatekeeper, first of all, that he deserves to have an audience with Nuda. So Nuda's gatekeeper is standing there and he walks up to him. And he says to him, Nuda says, Nuda's gatekeeper, sorry, he says to Lou, here, why should you get in there? Why the fuck should I let you in? What are you going to bring to the resistance and to the battle? And Lou says, well, listen, I'm a great warrior. I'm the sun god. I've got a magic spear, all right? I've won a lot of battles. I'm the fucking man. Right? You've heard of me. I'm Lou, all right? I've got the spear. And the gatekeeper doesn't give a fuck. Doesn't give a fuck. But then Lou says, well, I also i am quite handy with a harp. I've got a bit of musical prowess. And he describes how he can play the three genres of ancient Irish music, also known as the three noble strains. So they are the Soon Tree, which is lullaby music. You have the Gall Tree, which is sorrowful music. And you have the Gyan Tree, which is joyous music. So after the gatekeeper hears that Luke can play all three of these, he goes, right, on you go on in. And here you're seeing an example of just how important and powerful music is in Irish mythology. There's gods, while gods and heroes of other mythological, mythological traditions often prove themselves through feats of physical strength or intellectual acuity. In this case, Lou proves his worth not just by playing the harp competently, but by playing music that can elicit particular emotional sponsors, emotional responses from his audience. Fuck me, I'm struggling today, lads. So, there you are, lads. Go on ahead. 
channel your inner shanaki and give the world unique renditions renditions of every single piece you play each piece you play deserves to be treated with that love and respect and the world deserves to hear what you have to say about that piece so lads as you can hear i'm struggling a bit i'm gonna go for a pint all right have a lovely lovely weekend uh go see the kneecap movie if you've got time go and buy some inline g merchandise it launched last week it's doing well i'm making fuck all money on it but please go and buy some there's lovely t-shirts of really high quality i should have wore one but i've given them all away to everybody and i don't have one of my own so i'm gonna have to buy me one as well but anyway go have a lovely weekend i love you all so much and i'll see you next week for probably a guest episode but we'll find out Mm -hmm. big smooches